Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Attendance Bias. I am your host, Brian Weinstein. You know, when Attendance Bias was first getting off the ground about two years ago, it seemed like every guest or every other guest chose a show or a jam from the summer of 1999. Even though I didn't see any shows from that tour, it seemed that within a few weeks of this podcast, I became an expert on that time and place of fish history. Then as more and more guests came on the podcast, we ventured all throughout fish history and Summer 99 took a back seat. But today's guest is here to bring us back to our roots. And that guest is Jen Moore, who you may have previously heard on the Helping Friendly podcast. For today's episode, Jen chose to discuss just the first set of July 25th, 1999 at Deer Creek. Surely there is a virtually unlimited supply of special moments from Deer Creek, but Jen chose this set for many sentimental reasons that you're about to hear, but also because this set with its bust outs, its rarities, new material at the time, community vibe and goofiness sticks out in her show going life. So let's join Jen to talk about New York hippie towns, traveling throughout the Midwest, and being a budding hippie in law school as we discuss Fish's first set from July 25th, 1999 at Deer Creek. Jen, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm great, Brian. Thanks. How are you? I'm doing all right. Excited to talk to you today. It's been a while since Attendance Bias has come around to the summer of 99. When the podcast first started, it seemed like every other person chose a show from July of 1999. And then since then, it's kind of moved around and jumped around the fish time map. But now we're back to the roots with today's show, or at least one set of today's show, July 25th, 1999 at Deer Creek. So I'm excited to talk to you about it. I'm excited to talk to you about it. It's uh, my favorite first set of all time. Great. So we know why you're going to pick it, but let's talk to you about your background and your fish fandom with the Attendance Bias Lightning Round. Attendance Bias Lightning Round. So Jen, when was your first fish show and what are your memories of it? My first fish show was April 23rd, 1993. Fish played at my college. I went to Colgate University, which is in upstate New York, sort of between Syracuse and Utica, uh, really in the middle of nowhere. I had a friend, uh, a roommate, we called her Chugger. She had seen fish back in 91 at a prep school in the Northeast somewhere. She went to a different prep school and they put together, you know, a group of prep school kids, prep school hippies to go to the show uh, at the other prep school. And she was really excited that this band that I had never really heard of was coming to play at our college. They came for spring party weekend. They, um, the folks in, um, in residential life would always book a band or two or three for this, you know, big weekend in the spring. And that year they booked fish. I, I also got a phone call on, you know, at that point there was no cell phones. You got up and that you didn't have a phone in your room either. There was a hall phone in, in the dorm. And my friend Dave from home where I grew up, who was a deadhead called to see if I could get the student rate for him and some of his friends for this, for this concert that was coming to my college. And I, I hadn't seen the dead yet. And I didn't totally get it at that point. Dave was always an interesting but weird kind of person. But uh, if he wanted to go, sure, I, I was definitely going to go anyway because they were playing at my college, but it made me even more intrigued to see Fish that this other person uh, I knew wanted to go. Fish played in the basketball gym. It was you know, a college show and they were doing a bunch of shows in the Northeast in colleges that year. They played another pretty uh, famous show at SUNY Geneseo that same week, which is on the other end of the Finger Lakes of upstate New York. It, Colgate is a very preppy school. It's the mid nineties or early nineties. So we're thinking, you know, it's barn, J. Crew barn coats and those buck suede shoes that come in brown. And it was very preppy. A lot of the kids that attended came from prep schools in the Northeast and other uh, wealthy communities in the Northeast. And then all of a sudden on the day of the show, there were a bunch of hippies on campus. And that was really unusual. There was, you know, a fair amount of patchwork and patchouli and, of course, lots of flannel shirts. And at the bottom of the hill, there was actually a pub on campus. And we stopped by the pub on the way to my friend's dorm room. And instead of just the usual fraternity brother barn coat crowd, there were a bunch of folks that were there for the show. I've talked about that 
a lot on this podcast in previous episodes about how upstate New York and the SUNY system in general was kind of a breeding ground of the prototype well off, probably grew up in the suburbs somewhere in New York, uh, went to college and then kind of acted more as a hippie, like places like New Paltz, for yeah. example, or Ithaca, yes. you know, places like that, or Syracuse, like you mentioned, or Oneonta, where there are these schools that turn into college towns and these older teenagers, like 17, 18, or young 20s, come in there and they discover fish or the Grateful Dead or more likely in those times. And all of a sudden now it's like growing your hair out, buying your first bong, going to uh, the head shop in town because every college town has one. Uh -huh. And now fish can play there and sell out, you know, places like Colgate, where I don't think anyone who is um, a lesser means would really be able to afford four years of tuition. But you kind of pretend on the surface, you look that way because now you're into fish. Right. And so for me, too, it's interesting. I grew up in upstate New York. I grew up 40 minutes south of Ithaca. So all of the places uh, you're talking about, I grew up in between Binghamton, New York and Corning, New York, really in the middle of nowhere. Yep. But, it, but it was really the heart of what was happening for fish in the Northeast right then. And there was, you know, my, I'm, uh, I'm 48, I'll be 49 this year. So, and I graduated from college in 1995. So it's really just perfect timing and, and placement of myself for when it comes to fish, because I was a scholarship kid at Colgate. I, it was a really interesting um, shift in my, in my peer group. When I went to college, I came from a pretty, um, so it was a very small town, town of 5,000, working class, rural, NASCAR, hunting kind of vibe. And I always knew that it wasn't the place for me. And we had Ithaca 40 minutes away. And we spent a fair amount of time going there uh, when I was young. And, you know, my parents would take us there. And my grandparents lived, lived in Cortland, New York, which is in between Syracuse and Ithaca. And so that whole stretch, that whole central New York region is was really a, a breeding ground for, for fish and you know, the upcoming hippies. When I graduated from Colgate, I was not like my classmates. Most people were moving to New York or Boston and had a fancy job set up with, you know, uh, somewhere on wall street, or they were going to go be a paralegal at a law firm in Boston because they were going to go to law school eventually. And I took my graduation money and saw fish in the dead. They circled each other uh, in the mm -hmm. Northeast in, in June of 1995. And so I just took my graduation money, much to my parents' disappointment. But hey, <laughs> I was an adult now. And the tour ended actually in Vermont. It, the tour ended at Sugarbush. It was July 4th weekend. They played the second and the third, I think. And it was on the mountain. And I didn't have a plan for after that. And we were in Vermont and we came to Burlington and I was with a high school friend who did some of the shows that summer with me. And I thought, mm, I'm going to move to Burlington. And so on August 1st, you know, we, we moved to Burlington and uh, it was sort of the emerging hippie from upstate New York coming of age moment for me too. And in my experience, you know, Burlington much better than I do. Burlington has kind of maintained that vibe. Upstate New York, there are still remnants of it in the college towns. I went to Buffalo. I went to yeah. SUNY Buffalo. Sure. And there's still a couple bars. There's still a little bit of a scene uh, in Rochester, I think, more so than Buffalo, even though they're so close. But things are so much more segmented now and different types of music are so much more easily accessible. It's kind of hard to call any specific SUNY school now a hippie town, quote unquote. Right. Like I it was back then. Right. In the, and Oneana, you know, was, you know, we called it Stonyanta. Stonyanta, of course. You know? Still is. <laughs> Stonyanta. I don't know if it is anymore or not, but, you know, that was where we went to pick up things, uh, you yeah. know, in, in when we were in college. And I, of course, had the local upstate New York connection and friends from high school that went to, you know, Stonyanta and Al Albany and Geneseo and New Paltz and all of those places. So it was particularly that spring of 93. I haven't looked at the tour in a while to remember where else they played, but they did play a bunch at colleges, which probably was just a, a factor of where they were in their career and, and what kind of venues and they could book and what kind of tour they could book. But it really was a, 
a perfect launching pad for them to develop a, a really robust fan base that was just of the right age and just of the right motivation to, to start following fish. And like you were saying, the student rate, it's just the right timing and place where when a student residential activities or whatever you call that, uh, that group in any given college, when you get the student rate, it's either free or it's something like seven or 10 bucks. Like yeah, that's yeah, yeah, it was $10. Enjoyed. It was $10. It, the student rate was $10 to see fish at, at Cotterell Court. And uh, the non-student rate was $17, which is why my friend Dave from Cornell probably called me because that was a big difference in 1995 yeah. for, for college people. And later, several summers, a couple summers later, maybe two summers later, I would actually live in Ithaca for the summer in an apartment that Dave had rented. And um, I, I have very clear memories of learning more a lot about the Grateful Dead, but also like sitting and listening to like cassettes of fish shows and and all the fish studio stuff at that, you know, and the and that summer I can see the apartment and the, you know, the bare floors and you know, the mattress, you know, the crappy mattress that I slept in that summer and above the pizza shop, you know, so it's always smelled like pizza, which is not a terrible thing. Yeah, it could be worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well what was your most recent show and what did you think of it? I was fortunate to go to Dick's this year. Uh, normally, I do not go to Dick's. I live in Vermont and school starts for my kids the week before Labor Day. So school, it's like, haha, summer's over. Um, I grew up in New York where school starts after Labor Day. And here, school starts on the Wednesday before Labor Day. They make the kids go for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then it's off. And so I have two kids and that are in school and my husband is also a school teacher. And so getting to Dix is really, really bad timing for us. Normally we went one year, a few years ago, my friend turned 40 and she asked everyone if they would come to Dix for her birthday party. Her birthday was over that weekend that year. So we figured it out. It was complicated. We had to have some in-laws come and stay with kids and, and all, and my husband had to really hope he wasn't going to get reprimanded at work. Uh, but so this is my second dicks this, this past year, I asked in the spring, could I have dicks be my girls weekend this year? I usually try to fly somewhere and meet my girlfriends just by myself for, for a weekend or, you know, four or five days, some, sometime during the year. And this year I went uh, just, I went to dicks. It was really fantastic. It was a really tight trip for me. I didn't want school started on Wednesday, August 31st, my son started high school. My daughter started seventh grade. I wanted to be home that night when they got home to hear about the first day of school. So I took a 5, 10 a.m. flight Thursday morning out of Burlington, which whatever, I, I, I hate to travel on a show day. It's There's some extra stress about it, but I had no problems. My flight actually got to Denver early. I was in Denver at like 1030 in the morning, local time. And, uh, you know, the whole Dick's experience is really fantastic. I lived in Colorado um, after I lived in Burlington and from 95 to 97, I moved to Colorado and I lived there for five years and it's always nice to go back. I didn't do any of the Colorado things I would have liked to do. I didn't get to the mountains. Mm. Um, I, I don't really bother with tourist stuff in Denver because I used to live out there and I, right. you know, I'd i rather just relax around the pool and hang out with my friends. But it was so it was my second time at Dick's and, you know, the shows were really incredible, um, really, really incredible. And, you know, the first night had some really, you know, juicy pieces. The Ruby Waves Don't Doubt Me from the second set the first night is really, I, I go back and listen to that a lot. And then the lightning delay show right, the second right. night. Um the, the third night we had three people in my friend group got early entry numbers that night. So we were able to get, have a really nice spot down front, you know, maybe like seven, three throw center, you know, with like lots of space. And so we had that experience. And then the last night um, was also phenomenal. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I have an expectation when I go to fish that I'm going to have fun no matter what. There's there's no way I'm I'm not going to have fun and no matter what's going on in my life or you know the day of the show or or at the show itself like they're they're on stage and they're playing and I think anyone who went through the fish is over period understands or should understand how grateful we should all be that we can still all get together and go see this band and um, they're still playing music for us and they're still writing new music, but also doing new things with music they wrote 20 or 30 years ago. 
and, and you know it's 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 pretty cool so dicks was great i now i think have negotiated it as my girls weekend every year fingers crossed fingers crossed <laughs> say a little say a little wish for me i yep. think i think i can negotiate it i think i can what's the farthest you've ever traveled to see fish i went to europe 98 oh wow Posters actually right behind me um, here in my in my office, and I don't know. It felt really uh, felt really adventurous to be going to see to fly across the other side of the world to see fish, and I I knew just enough people that were doing it that we could figure it out. It's adventurous just to fly to Europe for any given reason, in my opinion. Yeah, and it was it was really fun. Uh, We. Flew into Amsterdam actually because if you're gonna go on fish tour in Europe, you should start in Amsterdam. And we saw a really incredible Dave Matthews Band show at the Milkweg in Amsterdam. Which Dave Matthews Band is not my favorite band. I, I like the, the music, um, but so that was fun. And and then we went to Copenhagen, and then we went to Prague, which is the farthest I've ever traveled. Boulder to to Prague is about five thousand miles. And two really killer shows there. Everyone knows the lore of, you know, the Prague ghosts and the Prague Piper and all of those things. And then we went to Barcelona for three more shows. So that that Europe tour was the furthest I've ever been to see fish, for sure. When you go to a show amongst a group of friends, which role do you play? Are you the type of person who is a designated driver? Are you... The opposite. Are you the guy with the supply? Are you the caretaker? Are you the one everyone has to look out for? Who are you amongst your group? I am, I have a few roles. I'm definitely the cat herder, like the organizer. <laughs> We're dicks, for example. And my friend that I was staying, I was staying with her and her husband in their hotel room and they got one of the early entry numbers. And I was like, okay, well, I don't have an early entry number. So I'm going to get to the line at this time. And then you guys need to get to the line at this time. And that means I have to leave before you, which means I have to trust that you're going to get in an Uber at, like you know, at, at, oh. at 345. Can, can you promise me that? Or when everyone's like, oh, we should go soon. And we're in the room or, you know, we're at someone's house or wherever, you know, we're in the lot. And I'm like, it's time to go. You know, after a few minutes of saying that and letting everybody know, I just start packing up my stuff and start walking. Yeah, you lead by example. Yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely lead by example. So I have that cat herder role. And I, I also like to facilitate people taking their hero's journeys. Um, <laughs> I always find that if someone wants to have that kind of experience and I can help them, and it's similar to my experience, we're all having a better time together. Sure. So, so a, a couple of different roles, probably. What is your most controversial fish opinion? Hmm. I love show of life. Uh, I don't think that's that crazy. I I didn't, you know, I thought it was a bummer in, you know, when it when it was first being played. And then I think it was played New Year's 2013 as the encore to this right. epic big show where right. they played the Jeff truck set right yep, in the middle. The, and yep, I loved the, it. Yeah, the anniversary show. I was yep. there. Yep. And when they played Show of Life, to me, it clicked. Like this makes perfect sense. They just time traveled back 30 years. And now right. they're kind of talking about what it looks like having gone by. And I'm like, oh, I like this song. Now. Right. Right. And they're wrapping it up. And and yeah, I mean, you know, I have a friend who just hates show of life. And like often you will hear people groaning when it starts. And I want I find that kind of rude and disrespectful. But it's cheesy. Of course, it's cheesy. Trey's talking about how much we love each other and how much they love us and and, and how, how much we love them. and. And let's just all be together and be, you know, happy that we've been able to do this for so long. And, you know, waves of people, they come and they go. It's so true. People at Dick's this summer, in, you know, just a few weeks ago, I ran into people that I had forgotten about. You know what I mean? Then you see them and you're like, oh my God, how have you been? Don't, you know, what, what are you up to? And Show of life really just kind of wraps all of that up. And so I don't care if it's slow and it's cheesy. I really am grateful that we still have the opportunity to be together as a community. And the song really expresses that. And finally, what is the weirdest thing you've ever seen at a fish show? Well, not the naked dude. Uh, At least he had some boots. 
Yeah. You know how many people say a naked dude on this show when I ask this question? It's not that weird. It's not that weird. Every Grateful Dead show I ever went to, including all of the iterations after Jerry died, Dead 50 and further and, and Dead and Company, there is always a naked dude. There is Almost always, never a naked chick. Always naked Almost dudes. never. Almost never a naked woman. Always a naked guy. And so, yeah, no, the naked guy is not weird. For me, I... I was thinking about like, you know, like, of course, freaks abound everywhere. That's one of the really fun and uh, fully human parts of fish for me is that everyone is allowed to let their freak flag fly Mm -hmm. and it might garner some looks, but not because you're being a freak, but people are curious and interested about why are you being so weird or you have that weird outfit or you're carrying that weird sign or maybe you're carrying like a baby monkey and introducing it to people. And, (laughs) you know, it's, it's, it's weird, but so that that's not the weird part for me. The weirdest thing for me was was Kid Rock at Vegas 2000. Uh, it was cool, right? Like it was it was timely and it, and it made sense considering where the band was at that point in terms of partying and rock and roll lifestyle. But when I see other actually big acts and I see sort of all of the the running around and the stage presence and the stage hyping that goes into other big rock and roll concerts, it's very different than Fish, yeah. right? You know, like they're engaging with us, but they're not like doing it like, woo, like everybody yell fish or everybody yell rock and roll. And Kid Rock came out and that was his vibe, which isn't bad, but you know, it was very different than the rock and roll experience I was having that night and had mostly been having. So Mm -hmm. it just felt really out of place. Like it was really fun, um, but it felt really strange. When was this show played? So today's show is played on July 25th, 1999 at Deer Creek. And in the summer of 99, Fish played quite a summer tour. It took up almost all of the month of July. They played 22 shows that month. And this was the second to last show of the whole tour. The next night, which was also at Deer Creek, closed the whole tour. Uh, This tour was also the first time in a really long time that Fish switched up their positions on stage, like for years, for almost their whole career, it was four across. Right. Right. But for the summer 99 tour, Fishman moved behind Mike and Trey, more like a traditional rock drummer. And Trey added also a small keyboard setup that you could hear in almost every show if you listen to that tour. And after this summer tour, they went to Japan. They would play a 24 show fall tour. And then after that, they played 14 shows just in December. It was obvious to us, well, it is obvious now to us in retrospect that they were kind of building up to Big Cypress. I don't think that was on anyone's mind during the summer. It was just a great long summer tour that was typical of their uh, itineraries of the time. But when you look back toward the second half, the latter half of 1999, it's pretty clear that they were just playing as much as they possibly could because they knew that the gig of their lives was coming up. So like I told you earlier, when I began this podcast about two years ago, 99 and 2000 were the years that I knew least about fish. And now I feel like I'm an expert. Now I feel like I could tell anything pretty, about pretty everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, they were pretty good years. But I think that a big part of that was when I was at the time, uh, contemporarily, a lot of the recordings weren't very good on tape. They were right. big and sure. boomy and they were playing these huge sheds and the sound didn't travel very well. So I didn't. Even when I had access to shows from summer 99 and most of 2000, I didn't even try to get them because even though I wanted to hear the latest stuff, when I pressed play on my cassette recorder or my Walkman, I could yeah. I could maybe hear just Trey. Right. It, yeah. It, it took some time for the sound quality on, on tapes to be what it was. And I remember you would, at, you would try to find certain tapers lineages because you could you would know that they would have a better quality recording or, you know, somewhere lower in the copy chain, right? Yes. Yeah. Get, get a second gen if you can. If you're lucky. Yeah. Right. If you can, if you can, yeah. yeah. If you can get a second gen, you're really, you know, you're on top of it. Try not to play it too much though. Cause you wear it out. Right. And you got too much hiss. So you're listening to that more so than the music. Uh, one thing that I've kind of gathered patterns now that I've gathered of summer 99, I'm probably the last of this party. Fish was number one at the time, deep into Farmhouse. The, at least the tracks that would end up on the album, not necessarily the song itself. Uh, and they were also in the summer of 99 and then later in the fall, able to kind of switch up between their laying ambient sounds that they perfected in 1998 that kind of spilled over into 99 and then supersonic speed jams. 
Yes. It was like they could just go from one to the other almost by the snap of a finger. And it's all seemed to make sense. It wasn't disorienting. I thought it would be that when I was typing this out, it sounded like I was writing it in a way that would be hard, that it would be disorienting or not fun to listen to, but they're totally in control in 1999 of their sound and their different styles. And who were you in the beginning, or at least at the end, I should say, who were you at the end of the summer of 1999? Well, you know, I was 25. So peak twenties in terms of, Interest in live music, ability to stay up all night, uh, ability to have a flexible schedule. I had moved to Boulder, Colorado in the summer of 1997 to go to CU Boulder Law School. And I waited a year and got residency so I could get in-state tuition. And so I I had just finished my first year of law school uh, that I started in the fall of 98 in May of 99. So I had had a really intense year in terms of my academic life. And also, I had moved to a different part of the country where I didn't really know anyone. I was in a new place. I had just undergone this really intense academic experience. The first year of law school was like academic hell. And, you know, I was also like this budding hippie. And so trying to be my, you know, baby hippie girl self while I was also 1L was pretty complicated. And, you know, uh, you know, you know, rip bongs before law school classes. And, you know, I had a friend that was a deadhead who would sit in the front row knitting during class, a guy, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I was like showing up to class in patchwork and it was in Boulder, Colorado. So th- I wasn't the only one. A budding was, hippie in Boulder. No way. Yeah. Oh, hey, I figured it out in our twenties in our mid twenties, <laughs> right? Like what does everybody do? They moved to Colorado. And so, but I was ahead of the curve. I did it in the nineties. So, you know, Living in Colorado was really great. I hadn't seen much fish since I had moved there. I didn't have the money to fly. We weren't really in like the flying to see fish mode yet. It was all road trips. At least for me, it was. And there were no Colorado shows that summer. I had gone to the, um, I had gone to uh, New Year's Eve 98 uh, at the garden. I had flown East for the, for the four nights at the garden. And, and then I had been fortunate enough to go to Phil and Friends with Trey and Paige in San Francisco. That oh my week. God, love those shows. Yeah, that was, it was a happy accident that I ended up getting tickets and it was a really life-changing experience, but I hadn't seen any, a lot of, I hadn't seen a lot of fish yet that year. And the first show of the tour was in Bonner Springs, Kansas. It was actually June 30th. So not July yet. And Kansas is the closest you could, could get that summer to Colorado to see fish. Um, but you know, I had a pretty good crew by the time the summer rolled around, I had been living in, in Boulder for two years. And so I had, you know, my, uh, cache of friends that I, I had met at shows in Boulder and Denver. I would just go see live music by myself. And, you know, when you're in your twenties, it's a lot easier to, to meet new people and, and, you know, feel, feel like I'm just going to go to the show by myself and I'll find my people there. I was looking for a release. I'll say that that much that summer. I had just had a really intense year and it was, there was a lot of fun, but it was really intense academically too. So I was looking to to let loose and have a good time. And so why did you pick this set, the first set mm-hmm. of July 25th, 99 at Deer Creek? When we talked about uh, me coming on this show, this was the set that popped into my mind. And I kept thinking, okay, well, what other shows or sets or, or jams would I want to talk about? And I was like going through my catalog and, and this one just kept popping up. So I I, we'd been to the show in Kansas uh, at the beginning of the tour. It was the opener of the summer. And then we just, we were going to the last four shows on this tour. So it was Polaris and then a night in Alpine and then two nights at, at Deer Creek. Th- there were no days off for all of that. So anyone that has done any driving around the Midwest to see this music or the dead or other music knows it looks really close, but it's actually not really close. Um, we drove all the way from Colorado, all the way to Ohio, whatever. There were probably two or three of us in the car, no big deal. We were in our 20s. Um, but, you know, that's a pretty far drive. So we start in Ohio. Uh, Trey tells us that night that New Year's is going to be in Florida. There are mm-hmm. a lot of Hawaii rumors floating around. And everyone was wanting to know, what is it going to be? Y2K was a big deal. And so then they told us Florida and, but there was no nights off. So we left after the show and because Ohio to Alpine, Columbus, Ohio, Polaris to Alpine Valley is at least seven hours. And to get up in the morning at what? 
10 and, and then get there at five and you have to drive past Chicago. And so I'm sure we left, we left after the show and slept, you know, at a rest area somewhere in Ohio and got woken up, you know, in the middle of the night by the police telling us to leave. I don't know why they do that. It's like people, you know, if you're there in the middle of the night sleeping, you probably need to sleep. But anyway, so we, you know, did Polaris and then we went to Alpine only one night at Alpine and then back to Deer Creek. So by this time we're, you know, not running on fumes, we're running on energy and what we've seen the previous two nights. And at that point there was still camping right behind the amphitheater at Deer Creek. I have not been back there since 2004. I've never been there. And so that was pretty fun, particularly in my, in my twenties. Yeah. You know, it was pretty raging. And I think my camp my tent was probably three or four rows off of the main shakedown. So if you remember what that might be like on a hot summer night somewhere. Yep, I do. And uh, so, you know, that's the setting for me and, and the time frame. And for me, of the shows I've seen, this is probably the most perfect first set ever. And it was also a really key time in my life. I was 25. I was working really hard. I was paying for law school myself. I had wanted to be a lawyer for as long as I remembered. And then I got there and I wasn't really sure anymore because the people were not my people. And I was still discovering who I am and I I still am now lifelong journey. (laughs) Um, But, you know, a fish was a way for me to have a sense of belonging and also a sense of adventure and very different from that law school experience, which was very serious. And people were you know, very serious about their careers and their futures. And I could go to fish and not be so serious. I could take psychedelics and explore what that part of my brain felt and and understood. And it really, it felt more urgent to do those kinds of things. The deeper I got into law school, I had, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, seen a lot of, you know, great music in 98 and 99 was really peak peak 98 through 2000 really peak musical years for me uh, from fish you know saw a lot of it was the string cheese was up and coming mm-hmm. then and yonder and i was living in colorado and the denver Fillmore opened when i was living there and you know you could go to the boulder theater or the fox theater in boulder any night and there was you know the ogden and all of these other venues in denver there was just so I was seeing so much music and, but this, this, I, I remember what I was wearing at this show. I still have that purple patchwork dress in my archives here. So I have some patchwork archives that made it through the years. I can remember that I was, you know, sitting on, on, you know, page side, tray side uh, in the level of the pavilion that's even with Corota. Like I can remember turning to the right and watching him during his silent light jam that we'll talk about in a second. So is the music important? Of course, when I listened to it this morning, even it's, I, I I know it by heart. It's my brain has absorbed it in a way that it doesn't even need to think about it um, anymore. It's just there, but the experience and where I was at in my life definitely come into play. Hi, everybody. Brian here to welcome you to the set break of today's episode of Attendance Bias. First, thank you for listening. And second, just a quick reminder to tell you that even though Attendance Bias comes to you for free, it does take a lot of work and it does take quite a bit of money to keep the lights on here at production. So I just wanted to ask a small favor if you could support the podcast in any number of the following ways. If you could leave a review or a rating of it on whichever podcast app you use. If you could spread the word telling a friend or someone you think may be interested in it about it, or probably the most concrete way is to go to www.buymeacoffee.com slash attendance bias and donate however much you can financially to help with the continuing costs of attendance bias. So thank you again so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the second half of today's episode. Set one. Well, let's dig into it. They open the first set with meat, which is an interesting spot for me. I don't know how many times it's opened a set. Uh, it turns out this was the first time that they played it in 1999. Uh, the, they played it 25 shows earlier, which was November 27th, 98 in Worcester. I, I did a little bit of research. 
Uh, but I don't know. It just seems a little bit of, of a good, almost like a moment dance kind of opener, like a slow, steady, let's yes. all get comfortable, bob our heads and move our shoulders a little bit. We're not really in the thick of it just yet. And yet when I listen to it, the word that I use to describe Mike's bass is sticky for this. Sticky. It's really sludgy and slow, this whole opener. Mm-hmm. It's really thick. it's not a rager it's not about that with that song and and this version of it is particularly juicy like you said mike's bass is just really sticky and they're in no rush and they're there to play and they're just getting everybody including themselves on board with what's going to happen for for the show and then second spot is my friend my friend which is a perfect follow-up because meat, I feel like broke the tension of when the lights go down and the whole crowd is exciting. Everyone's kind of digging their fingernails into their palms. Like, what are they going to play? I'm so excited. Can't wait. We drove however many hours we haven't slept since whenever we all know that feeling, you know, when the we anticipation do. builds up and meat diffuses that tension. And then my friend, my friend kind of ups the ante a little bit. It's like, all right, now we're musically showing you some tension And even though the vocals I thought were a little less intense than usual, but then I ignored all that when the crazy build comes in at about four minutes, the whole crowd gets whipped up into a frenzy. Well, my friend, my friend is a creepy song, right? There are songs that are creepy in Fish's repertoire. Esther is one of them, Uh, you know, that, uh, but my friend, my friend is always for me, a, a business song. Like, oh, <laughs> well, what would they mean business now? Yeah, your law school friends would not approve that. Not that kind of business. No, it is business. Oh, you know, you, you, you start with the meat and like you think, oh, what a nice way to ease into fish. And all of a sudden they're like evil fish mode on. And this version in particular um, is, I think, really uh, intense. And I think you're correct that the vocals aren't necessarily intense, but once you get to that four minute mark and, and the music starts to build like crazy and you know, there's some screaming, uh, it's really very opposite of, of the meat opener. And, yeah. you know, my friend, my friend, it's, it's in the, it's in the creepy genre for me. Oh, for sure. And, and it like fades it. out perfectly into my left toe, oh. which is a rarity. It's a treat. Mm-hmm. I once heard my left toe without knowing that I heard it. It was at a Nassau Coliseum show. They played it within a tweezer. Sure. And I yeah. didn't know what I was hearing because like I told you, I didn't get a lot of 1999 tapes at the time. I think there would be a lot of folks that wouldn't rec- see it now if it was in the middle of one of the big jams. You know, they wouldn't recognize it as a distinct um, piece of music, but it is. And it's really, you know, you know, the, the arrow symbol for a seg, right? Yeah. Like the, the, my friend, my friend, my left toe is a perfect example of that is what that symbol was made to describe. I think there's no, there's no hesitation between the two pieces of music. They melt into each other. They flow together perfectly so much so that maybe you don't even realize it's my left toe. And, you know, I think that would happen if my, if they played my left toe again, this for me is really the beginning of a huge chunk of this set that is so musically precise but also playful and funny and dark and spontaneous and spontaneous and 
this the lead into to where it goes of course um i you know i've listened to the, the transition into the next song i don't know that a thousand times <laughs> and, <laughs> and this you know the my left toe jam is just a really nice exploration there's some really light notes in it you know it gets a little airy at the beginning and then it's deep and dark but it gets aggressive too Not as, no. For those people listening to this episode who haven't heard this show or my left toe at all, it's not always as pleasant as Jen is describing it. Not to take anything away from you, no, but it gets. You know, I one one thing that I thought is, well, actually, I use the word pleasant. My one of my notes says it's very pleasant, but is it all that different and structured from like a deep tweezer jam? At around seven or eight minutes, it does get aggressive and dark. It has attitude. Like I liked where it was going when I was oh. listening for the first time. Yeah. It's like, I mean, excuse the phrase, but it is like, it becomes cock rock, like somewhere yeah. towards the end, big time. And almost as if you're tunneling deep down into a hole somewhere, um, you know, as if the music is spiraling deeply into some sort of vortex is, is where this jam goes. And, and you can hear hints, you know, towards the end of the, my left toe jam of what's going to come next. I don't, recall that we recognized it as such in the moment i I mean you can hear it now and maybe if if i heard this segment of music played now i i would recognize it in the moment but i don't i don't think we did uh at the time well now we have the benefit of like 23 years of hindsight Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah and for those of you who are unaware what comes next is whipping post an Almond Brothers cover, and you can hear it at the end of My Left Toe. We have the benefit of hindsight, but you can hear bits and pieces of Whipping Post. Yeah, they and you know it's clear, you know, looking back also, right in the hindsight mode, that they intended to play it, that it wasn't an accident. And something I've always been curious about is, um, you know, we'll talk about this in a minute too, but it was Corona's birthday that day, and so I always wondered if he requested it, or if he really liked the song, or why in this moment, I, I they have not played it since. This was the last time they no. played it. Yeah, and it was the first time they played it since August 10th, 1996 at Alpine Valley, right. which was 208 so, shows. In Alpine Valley, it's like right next door, right? In, right. in the Midwest way. Yes, like you in the, said, in the, in the Fish Tour Midwest way, yeah. Alpine Valley is the next door neighbor for sure. But right, so it's interesting, you know, to think about why, why they chose that for a first set song but yes please please play it again someday um for me in the transition into whipping post and when you realize it's it's whipping post i still can feel that sensation in my body and you know the 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 my rising heart rate and like the excitement that comes when you realize it's whipping post is pretty awesome whipping post one of the greatest rock songs of all time by one of the greatest rock bands of all time everything that a fish dream cover is made of.
I love before that Trey comes in with the vocals, it almost sounds like they're right on the edge of it. Like they're playing on the edge where they're th- collectively thinking like we found ourselves in this music. We're in the middle of that very recognizable whipping post jam that's in, I don't even know, maybe seven, four time, like that strange time signature Mm -hmm. that it's very hard to find yourself accidentally playing whipping post. Uh, But they're like right in it. And I wonder if they're collectively thinking like we found ourselves in this music. Are we going to go all the way and actually play it or just leave it as a tease and, you know, have the tapers note it, but they go all the way, you know, there's strong, passionate singing from Trey, like a huge peak, and then they hit the change at seven oh. minutes where it slows down to half yeah. time. And it's like, holy shit, these are the four most talented musicians on stage in the world at the moment. Maybe. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. Playing one of the greatest rock songs of all time. And, you know, it, it, the enthusiasm you can hear in the playing and in Trey singing uh, is is unmatched it's really incredible enthusiasm and it's you know this power of southern rock song peaks to it and I will confess that you know when I'm listening to it I I scream along and sing sing for a while and then scream along at the end you know it's uh I, I it would be hard to not do that I think with this version of this song in this moment totally and the other Go thing ahead. too is it's summertime and so this is the first set and it's still kind of light out it's not dark yet Right. So usually for me, you know, those big power rock jam moments come, you know, at night. Right. That's when you go to see rock and roll at night. Yeah. Although I wish bands would start playing earlier so I could get to bed at like 11 o'clock. But (laughs) uh, that's a different conversation. But, you know, it's still it's not the sun is still setting at this time. And so it's, you know, you're four songs, three songs into the uh, and four songs into the first set of the show what else is possible well what's possible is next the big relief if whipping post is the big tension and the big build and peak then up next is maka super policeman with a segue into happy birthday i don't know if i would count it as a separate track because it's kind of a goof song uh, but back into maka super so it's comic relief after this big dramatic you were talking about the emotions that you felt and how you could still like access that 20 what is it 26 years later I, i'm bad at math but <laughs> how you could still access that makasupa happy birthday makasupa the happy birthday as you mentioned for chris Kuroda. this track is 10 minutes long by the way this isn't like yeah. a three minute makasupa no. policeman joke this is a whole portion of the set it's it's a significant portion of the set and I, I think this is a perfectly constructed set for me. And maybe that's why I keep going back to it. It's got a nice, easy opener. It's got a deep evil fish song. It's got an incredible stag into, into just an instrumental. It's got a great cover. And then here we are. And it's Chris Grota's birthday. And Maka Soup is always a fun song anyway. At this point, you know, it's we don't live in the future yet. It's not like weed's not legal. And so it feels... It, it still feels a little dangerous to be driving around the country with your with your goo balls and your and your cannabis and you know your your nuggets probably hey, in some places like Deer Creek and Indiana. Alpine Valley it's still scary right. right you're in Indiana it's not a joke um, I was living in Colorado and it's you know it wasn't even as loose as then as it is now it was looser than Indiana though and 
God, you know, goo balls keeps coming up in my friend group conversations lately. And so maybe next summer I'll just have to make some goo balls. Uh, What's just- your recipe? When you get a goo ball, what do you expect to be in there? Obviously peanut butter and granola, right? But, and the extra peanut ingredients. Butter, granola, the extra ingredients. You can have all kinds of delicious but things. But I'm curious, what do you see as the perfect, like the typical goo ball? You buy it. There's, there's definitely got to be some like oats in there. I really like the peanut butter, maybe some chocolate chips, depending on time of year and if they're going to get all melty. Um, I really like kind of the surprise of the goo ball. I know everything is measured and and dosed at a milligram level. Now you can get everything you want and like very perfectly measured doses, but there's something really fun and adventurous about getting something that you don't only, not only understand the dose of, but you might not totally understand the components of either, right? Like, and sometimes it's a bust. Hopefully, hopefully the person making them wash their hands. Yeah. You know? But um, to what your point is, when Makisuba policeman, when Trey says the keyword, right, he lists them all. He says goo balls, brownies, stink, stink kind, nugs, keef. Like he just goes nuts. Right. Remember, we used to call them nugs. Yeah, heady nugs. nugs. Heady nugs. But yeah, so you know, Trey does like the, the traditional what's the weed word gonna be in maca supa. And you know, there's a little uh, jammed out um uh synthesizer from page and you know, house, house, house. You know, the, the middle of Makasupa is let's sing happy birthday to Kuroda. To what Trey calls our closest friend, right. Chris Kuroda. Mm-hmm. From way back, he says. From way back. And, you know, they sing the traditional, you know, happy birthday to you. And and then they uh, sing, you know, happy birthday to you. We're going to get you so wasted after the show tonight. Yeah. You know, and I think to that kind of stuff at that point, you know, Fish always felt like a community to me and it always felt like more than going to a concert. And that was one of kind of one of those moments where the, you know, the band is acting, you know, interacting with Chris Crota and really showing that it's really just one big family scene and at that point too, I had, I hung out with a, a group of friends and their sort of their external circle was the group of folks that, uh, that came up with CK five and they oh, yeah. developed a little organization to get Chris recognized and would hand out little CK five stickers. That looked like the Calvin Klein logo. Yep. That looked like the Calvin Klein logo. I still have a t-shirt somewhere deep in the archives with that CK five logo on it. So it felt really fun to be 
singing Chris Crow to happy birthday at that moment, just with the context that I had, I was living in. And then Chris thanks the band over the PA. He does. From the, takes, which is very sweet. Which is very sweet. It takes, a, it takes, there's a pretty big pause after the end of happy birthday, Makasupa. And then it takes a minute and then, yeah, Chris gets on and, and, and says, thanks, which is also really nice. And, you know, keeps that community vibe going. And then they kick back into a set proper, you know, the, the, the personal jokey, fun, meaningful stuff. It's not over, but it's like, we're moving on to a more of a typical first set where they play. I saw it again, which is slow and gradual. Everyone always loves it. I feel like this is a fan favorite. It's hard to argue against. Right. It's creepy fish. Again, it goes, yep. into that, it goes, in, it's in that creepy fish category along with the guester and, and my friend, my friend, it's, it's really dark. It, there's something really strange about the the time signature of it that makes it feel really like weird and chaotic isn't the right word, but as if you're sort of stumbling through a carnival. Yes. Like, late yeah. at night when it's dark and you really shouldn't be. That's how I feel about Esther as well. <laughs> right. You, yeah. You dropped it before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Same vibe. Same vibe. And after that is Boogie on Reggae Woman, which is a perfect call. And it was at this point where I thought I could see why she listens to this set over and over again. There's no wasted space. No. And it seems like there's segments that you can kind of compartmentalize where it's cool. like fun opener, goofy middle, a little more evil. And now we're getting to the big power ending of Boogie on Reggae Woman and Cavern that closed the set. Right. Like I said before, it, it's really perfectly constructed in terms of you, you kind of get everything you might want out of a fish show in this one set. You get some goofiness, you get some some personal connection with the crow to happy birthday. You get a raging rock cover with whipping posts. You get some creepy stuff with I saw it again and me. You get some funky, you know, mic driven songs like Boogie on Reggae Woman. And you know, it was just like a nice dance party after all of that weirdness. And then I saw it again. It was really dark, really nice first set, late first set song in the summertime, particularly, you know, you're somewhere in a cornfield in the middle of the United States and <laughs> you're dancing to Stevie Wonder played by a bunch of white guys in your patchwork dress and probably Birkenstocks, I would guess. And they nail it, too. There's a lot of great piano playing. Uh, Mike is, again, of course, he always leads Boogie on Reggae Woman. Uh, And there's Trey is playing great rhythm guitar, like a full jam. This is an 11 minute Boogie on Reggae Woman. It's a really nice version of Boogie Allen. Really nice. And they close the whole set with Cavern. It's a short set, but like you said, perfectly packed, perfectly constructed. And it leaves the whole audience aching for the second set. And, you know, it's funny. After I chose the first set, I was I was like, okay, well, I'm going to listen to the whole show. I know I've listened to the first set more, more than any other first set I've ever, list, I've ever listened to. And I was like, why didn't I choose the second set, too? It's actually quite good. Um you know, it's quite good also, but I guess I'll just listen to it more. Maybe I can talk to you about it. Another you can time. make a return appearance. Right. We can, we, I can do a deep dive. Into right. Got to leave something for the sequel. <laughs> so Jen Moore, thank you so much for coming on to talk about set one of July 25th, 1999 at Deer Creek. Everything that you need in in a fish concert in one set, actually. So it's really been a pleasure talking to you, hearing about 
are inflections of upstate New York, fish in both 1993 and 1999, and everything in between. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on Attendance Bias today. It was really nice to talk to you. It was also really nice to go back and revisit the set and remember who I was at the time and to listen to the music 23 years later, or however long it's been, and still be just as moved and excited to listen to the set as I was back then. And that's it for today's discussion with Jen, but let's make sure we got everything right with the Attendance Bias Fact Check. Attendance Bias Fact Check. As mentioned, Jen's first show was April 23rd, 1993 at Colgate University. Anyone who read or owned the Fish Book would recognize this show, as it was the one where Mike and other band members paraded around the stage with huge banners that read, We win in our gym, and winners play hard. There were several pictures of this show in the Fish Book. Jen mentioned that she had a friend who saw Fish in 1991 at, quote, a prep school in the Northeast. Although this is not confirmed, but all attendance bias research suggests that Jen's friend saw Fish at the Salisbury School in Salisbury, Connecticut on May 19, 1991. Jen mentions that Fish played a, quote, pretty famous show at Geneseo the same week as her first show at Colgate. That show at Geneseo was two days later on April 25th, 1993. That show features tons of teases, gimmicks, and onstage banter with It's Ice and Glide being featured musical motifs throughout the show, plus lots of discussion of Trey's pedal boards. I mentioned that I once saw My Left Toe in the middle of Tweezer, but I didn't recognize the song at the time. And there's good reason for that. I was only half right. The show was October 8th, 1999 at the Nassau Coliseum, and My Left Toe was teased in Tweezer, but not played outright. And that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Jen Moore for joining me today, Fish.net for its help with the fact check, and Fish.in for the recording used in today's episode. If you enjoy Attendance Bias, please support the show by leaving a rating and a review of it on your favorite podcast app. You can also follow Attendance Bias on social media, on Instagram and Twitter. But by far, the best and most concrete way to support the podcast is to visit www.buymeacoffee.com slash attendance bias. Every penny goes to the podcast. So thank you again for listening, and I'll see you next week on Attendance Bias. Attendance Bias.